question of criminal violence and corruption in Mexico for a long time. I have also been working in Brazil, and I'm not going to be talking about that today, but more about Mexico. And then, then so before I present this work, the presentation was a, a, a long one, so I'll try to put it in, in 15 minutes, which, which is going to be challenging. So I try not to put a lot of data, but uh, there is some data here. But before I begin the presentation, I just want to motivate you by a general um, concern about what is going on in Mexico. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about the country, we had a transition to democracy in 2000 when, when the PRI, which was the party in power for 70 years, was first defeated. And so in a, in a paradoxical way, things have turned really sour for Mexico after the transition. Um, so we have more human rights violations than we used to have during the authoritarian era, more practice of torture by the police and the military. We have more violence and possibly also more corruption. Um, here I'm talking about the, the type of corruption by governments that facilitate this type of, of violence. I'm not talking about uh, corruption, uh, I'm not measuring corruption as uh, grabbing money illegally, but obviously it is driven by that. It's a lot of it is driven by greed and the association between uh, politicians, between police and between local, especially local governments and <coughs> criminal organizations. So um, the, the research questions, uh, this is the outline of the presentation. I'm not going to, <laughs> okay. So two ma main questions uh, motivate this presentation. So the first is, we want to understand the conditions under which drug cartels perform their illegal operations without targeting the community. So in Mexico, we used to have a lot of drug trafficking happening, but the community barely noticed it. There was a lot of corruption um, at the national level. I mean, it is even believed that the president negotiated the country with a group of four cartels and that the country was well divided. There was very little violence. There was a lot of drug trafficking going on, but the population barely noticed it. And all of a sudden, we now observe cartels increasingly turning more against the population. We see issues like extortion that affect a lot small businesses in particular. So you have to pay to the cartels to run your business. And if you don't do that, they kill you and your family. And we also start increasingly to observe more issues like sexual violence, um, uh, human trafficking, and really nasty behavior on the part of the cartels towards the community. We want to understand why that change happens, why cartels behave so differently. And we also want to understand why cartels under some conditions um, co-op the community and really offer collective benefits to the community in the form of, one of them is conflict resolution. Uh, Gambetta very clearly described this in his study of the Sicilian mafia. But we also observe many cases where cartels offer money to buy houses or loans uh, to afford medical emergencies, etc. So we really want to understand this cooptation versus coercion strategies by the cartels. Uh, and I here bring some examples, but I, I mean, I, I have to be short on this, but this is one side from, one quote from a man in Sinaloa saying, here the narcos are careful with the community they even have store, food stores where you can buy everything much cheaper. Have you be, can you believe it? Last time the Chapo, you know he was um, uh, finally put in prison and extradited, uh, was on the run. Some people told me that, he, that they knew of people who helped him hide, even hosting him in their home. So this is a, a quote that tells that the you know, cartel was quite embedded in the community and that in many instances, community they didn't really fear the narcos that much. And these are two examples of uh, extortion. Um, one quote is from Michoacan saying, well, drug traffickers here come to collect money from us. We need to pay because if we don't, they kill you and your family. The police does nothing because they are working together, collecting money for the cartels. And then this is another example that came out recently in, um, in, in a magazine called Proceso uh, that has very good coverage of violence uh, in Mexico. And it's a very disturbing um, long article about Los Zetas and how they are virtually running killing fields. That's the way I can describe it. 
And this is running, this has been run from the prison El Cerezo in Piedras Negras in Coahuila. <laughs> and what they literally describe is that they bring to the prison um, hundreds of bodies of you know, rape victims, and then they incinerate them in the prison. So they disappear them. And the bodies are of women, men, children, um, so members of the community. Um, and in many of these cases, it's either because they refuse to pay the money um, to run their businesses, the extortion, el derecho de piso, or whatever reason they get in, in, in conflict with the cartels. Um, so to measure this, obviously, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to conduct this type of work. We have been doing this type of work both in, in Brazil and in Mexico, and there are very many ways in which you can do this. One is to make good partnerships with local um, organizations that work on the ground. And, and in this case, we don't do that, but we've done uh, a lot of that in Mexico and Brazil. Here, what we did is run um, an, um, a survey experiment um, using list experiments that try to go around the issue of fear, because obviously if you ask these questions, um, you know, do you pay money to the cartels and you, they don't trust you, they're not going to answer truthfully. So these experiments try to go around the, the issue of, you know, fear, social desirability, and so on. So I'll talk more about how much we gain from these experiments versus using victimization service. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background in Mexico uh, in terms of violence. Between 2006 and 2015, there were more than uh, 180,000 people murdered in the country. According to official figures, 30,000 people have disappeared, and this is the ones that we know, the ones that are registered. But obviously the figure must be much larger. And uh, recently, Mexican authorities have uncovered more than 200 mass graves um, all over the country, containing more than 600 bodies. And these mass graves continue to appear around the country. So the situation is it's very, it's very disturbing. It's beyond violence. It's just the type of violence that is being used increasingly. And this is just to describe this is not murder rates, but just counts. Um, and as you can see, there is a sharp increase in, the, in violence in 2007. The dark part reflects some of the best estimations we have of, of, of murders that happen between drug cartels fighting each other. And then the gray area is murders that uh, affect the general population. So there is a very sharp increase in 2007, and that increase coincides with the... So this is how it was in 2007. And this is how it looks in, in 2011. I'm stopping here in 11 because that, that's where we collected the survey. But the country is increasingly going more violent in all this region, which is the area where Mexico produces um, poppies for heroin. And as you know, the US is experiencing one of the most severe health crises in, in many, many decades that relate to heroin consumption. So that is really feeding a lot of the violence here, but the survey, uh, this data that we are collecting is 2011. We have also calculated all the turf wars that happen among cartels. This comes from a PhD dissertation by Gustavo Robles. Um, and just to, uh, so turf wars are defined as unusual increases in violence that happen in different communities. And the size of the circles tell you how many people are dying. So just to tell you where, uh, cartels fighting is in areas suitable for cultivation of drugs, as I just described, the area for uh, production of poppies. Uh, areas near the transportation network, so ports. Uh, in the south of the country, a lot of the cocaine coming from the, uh, South America arrives there, and also the chemicals necessary to produce methamphetamine, so that, uh, that um, explains the violence in some of the ports in the south and in the west area of the country. And obviously, they are also fighting for control of valuable drug trafficking routes that you know bring the drugs to the U.S. So that's why the violence is very intense in the north of the country. Um, and um, so, the, one of the reasons why the drug um, you see this sharp increase in violence in 2007 is that mm, the former president uh, of Mexico, Felipe Calderón, decided to start a, a drug war. And basically what he said is, I'm going to send the army to find the cartels. 
so it's the first time we see the army deployed in so many states in Mexico and they virtually have become law enforcers um, in the country. Second, uh, they continue to do drug seizures, burning, ma uh, burning marijuana and poppy uh, crops. A very different strategy that this president followed was that he decided to attack the cartels in their organization by arresting the leaders of them. Uh, so this is the operations. Nine states had the presence of the army, and this is the, the, the list that actually he released at the beginning of his administration. They are, the, the colors reflect the different cartels, and then the pictures obviously are the you know, main uh, drug leaders, and um, they arrested or killed all of these uh, leaders during the administration. We did a, the, actually, the government approached us to analyze the impact of these strategies, um, uh, and we did a you know, very long study. We were able to demonstrate that the, this strategy, unfortunately, dispersed violence in Mexico in, and for three reasons. One was that when you arrest the leader of the cartel, there are fights among the, <laughs> the cartels of, as, as to whom is going to replace the leader. Second is that when a cartel uh, loses his leader, they become weaker and other organizations find that as an opportunity to attack the territory. And the third, which is really what worries us the most, has to do with the way the cartels relate to the population. So normally drug cartels and the leaders have certain interest in controlling the behavior of their criminal cells. And when they remove the, uh, the leaders, the criminal service really become in a way loose and start preying on the population. And this is really what we have observed a, a metamorphosis of the criminal groups in Mexico. We have on the one hand, more and more criminal groups operating. Now the government counted 17 cartels and all the you know, criminal gangs operating. Then criminal groups have turned to other lines of uh, business, as I mentioned, it used to be drug trafficking, now it's extortion and some other activities. And increasingly they are targeting, and this is what, what the area of corruption comes, they are targeting local governments, uh, they are really trying to capture local governments because to perform all these illegal operations, they need the cooperation of law enforcement agents, especially if you want to turn against the population, do all these crimes, local police and the local prosecutors are in charge of these crimes. So increasingly we see more and more local governments working in association with the cartels, so that this is really what I describe as a, as a form of criminal governance or a form of mafia state really operating in many parts of Mexico. So just because I, I have very little time, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to skip the literature but basically we have um, five hypotheses that we want to evaluate. Um, one of, and we draw from the civil war literature and also from literature on drug trafficking violence. With regards to these activities um, or strategies cartels use towards the community. So our first hypothesis is that where you have higher levels of contestation among cartels, you are going to have more extortion. And I can go all over you know, why this is the case. When you have monopoly control, so only one cartel is in control of a territory, we expect to have more benign behavior towards the community. This type of behavior I notice of the chapo running sort of um, selling uh, food uh, cheap for the community or even giving money um, in credit and so on. So we also have some expectations with regard to how criminal groups are organized. So more hierarchical uh, criminal groups that have a leadership stability would have, in according to our hypothesis, less, um, more benign behavior towards the community. And the last part, which deals more with the theme of the, of the conference, has to do with collusion or capture by the state. Uh, sorry, by a, a capture of the state by criminal groups. And here, but it's very hard to measure. We are doing all sorts of different uh, analysis with victimization surveys to really try to tackle the question of police corruption and, uh, and the capture of criminal organizations of local police. But here we are going to have a very simple hypothesis that relates to who, which party controls the local office. And for reasons that I you know, don't have time to explain, the PRI has been traditionally 
um, characterized by being a, a party that is very tolerant uh, with criminal groups and also has profited a lot from that association with criminal groups. The PAN, as I mentioned, began this drug um, war and actually the sort of mandate of the president, although it didn't produce the desired results, was to really fight um, drug cartels and try to break those associations. So with the, um, the use of this list experiment, I'm going to run because I don't have time. I don't know how much time, two minutes. Okay, so we, uh, just to give you an example of what a list experiment looks like for those of you who haven't seen it, many of you must have, but the idea is to add a series of, uh, of items that are not really very controversial. So for example, in this case, I asked, um, we asked, you know, please tell me of the following activities which you have done. I got drunk at a party I went to, I did some exercise outdoors, I attended church, um, I attend church almost every Sunday. And then the <coughs> treatment group receives this, um, this additional item that says I have given money to drug or criminal organizations so that they do not harm me. Okay, and so all that, you have two groups and one randomly assigned, the group receives this, this you know, treatment. And really the difference in the average response between one group and the other tells you the extent to which there is, in this case, extortion by criminal organizations. So we did, um, I'm sorry you cannot read this, but we did four experiments, one that had to do with extortion, as I just mentioned, the other with health. So the conditions under which you ask help for criminal organizations, and then also police corruption. And the last one, whether they are observing convoys of armed men that do not belong to the army or the police. Obviously these are you know, criminals. And in Mexico, everybody knows how they look. You know, they come in the big SUVs with, you know, they, with guns and so on. So we just wanted to ask how present these organizations are in Mexico. And um, so just to give, please don't read the numbers, but just on average, 38% of the Mexican population reports having seen armed convoys. Uh, around 15% reports uh, being extorted by the criminal groups. Ele the same proportion reports uh, having uh, been extorted by the, by the police. And help from criminals is around 12%. And then, you know, th those, those show the, the, so the territorial contestation variable, I, you know, I again don't have time, but we constructed, you know, we know where each cartel operates in Mexico. We constructed this um, measure of cartel dominance, so we can know places where one cartel dominates versus places where there is contest contestation. So that's another of our dependent variables. And, um, and finally, these are the results. So I think it more or less supports what we are saying. So in contested areas, so where you have more cartels, you have significantly higher levels of extortion. Um, and in terms of help uh, by criminal organizations, we have more help in monopoly areas and also more help in areas of low violence. Um, and then here quickly, which is the part of the corruption that I wanted to mention, we have very strong effects for pan governments being engaged with significantly less extortion uh, than PRI governments. And this is, um, this is something that deserves more um, research, but we do find a very strong difference in the way the PAN and the PRI are engaging with criminal groups. And this controls for all sorts of um, uh, indicators of the locality. So for example, PRI tends to win in poorer places, so we control for that. We control for whether the locality is rural or urban, and also we control for all sorts of you know, individual level characteristics. So, so the conclusion here is that, the, well, about the cartels, it's interesting, I'm not going to go in detail, but we do find very strong evidence that the Sinaloa cartel engages more in uh, help versus the Zetas, which are very, very violent, and also La Familia Michoacana, which at the moment one year before the survey, the leader of La Familia Michoacana had been arrested and the region was um, completely taken over by the Zetas and other cartels. So it was a region that was very highly contested. So the conclusion is that criminal extortion has increased significantly in Mexico as a result of, on the one hand, government policies that contributed to this metamorphosis of criminal groups through the leadership arrest and the increased multiplication of criminal groups 
and then this um, new you know sort of way in which criminal groups are capturing local government to perform their illegal operations with uh, complete impunity and this is a, a form of really worrisome form of mafia state that is really developing in, in, in Mexico um, that uh, that has produced more violations of human rights more violence and atrocities than the authoritarian regime of the last 70 years okay that, that's uh, a little longer uh, but little. <laughs> thank you thank you